Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 144 teen crushes i'm your host madison whalen and my co-host joseph whalen hello maddie how you doing today i'm doing all right how about you i'm doing okay kind of a rough end of the day at work today but other than that i think i'm doing good how about yourself i've been doing fine so far today good good week so far yeah, I have now gotten my AutoCAD certification. Congratulations. Just need to print it out. Just need to print it out. You know it's legit when you got to print it out yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, good for you. Good for you. Maybe we can get you a job this summer then. Hopefully. All well, right. yeah. Well, with marching band, we might want to be careful, but you know. Okay. Well, maybe not this summer then. We'll figure it out. I'm sure we will. Anyway. That's not what we're talking about today. No, it's not. So, we're going to be talking about teen crushes today. Yes, we are. So, having crushes can be a wonderful, scary, fun, and heartbreaking experience. When you get your first crush, you may feel confused about what's happening. You may have never had these feelings before. On today's episode of Insights into Teens, we'll talk about what crushes are, the risks associated with them, the importance they play in adolescence, in adolescent development, and ultimately, how to help your teen handle rejection associated with them. Because we always assume crushes end in rejection, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. But before, um, but first, I'd like to invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions of the podcast listed as insights into teens. You can all. You can also get both video and audio versions of the podcast listed as Insights into Things. We can be found on pretty much any podcast service like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and pretty much any other place. Um, we would also like to invite you to contact us, give us your feedback, tell us what we're doing. Send well, we know what we're doing. Tell us how we're doing. Tell us how we're doing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Tell, <clears throat> tell us how we're doing. Send in your suggestions for topics topics you'd like us to address, even topics you don't want us to address, you know. <laughs> Any feedback's welcome. You can email us at comments at insightsinthethings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can find high-res videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. We stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can get audio versions at podcast.insightsintoteens.com. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. We're on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things. Or you can get links to all of these and more on the web at insightsintothings.com. Okay. Are we ready? I think we are. So what are teenage crushes? And this comes to us from psychologytoday.com, which I'm pretty sure we've used in the past. Indeed. So teenage crushes have a significant role to play in the journey of adolescence. There are three types of crushes, two of which we'll look in further detail, which are identity crushes, romantic crushes, and celebrity crushes. In the cases of identity and romantic crushes, the teenager feels smitten. Smitten? Smitten, yes. Okay. You wrote it. You can't pronounce it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the teenager feels smitten by a compelling person who captivates their attention for good and ill. 
The celebrity crush shapes ideals and stirs fantasies, but there is no, usually no interpersonal contact to play them out. However, this is definitely where the market for celebrity posters comes in to decorate teenage bedroom walls. Nice. <laughs> mm. In all three cases, the young person largely projects onto another person ide- person idealized attributes the admirer highly values and wants to be associated with. They Then they attach strong positive feelings to the perfectly wonderful image that has been created. Crushes have more to do with fantasy than with reality, and they tell much more about the admirer than the admired. This is because they usually prove unrealistic that in a relatively short time they soon wear off. But it is because of the idealization that crushes have such a monumentary power. Momentary. Momentary power. This is why parents need to respect an adolescent crush and not dismiss dismiss or put it down. After all, it is an early approximation of love. While it, while it last is seriously while it last it is seriously held, so it should be seriously treated. Boy, it's like the Star Wars script. Carrie Fisher had once remarked about the original Star Wars script. You can write this stuff, but you can't read it, right? <laughs> It's okay. You did a fine job there. So, so crushes themselves are, as they say here, they're idealizations. It's, it's really not a reality. Um, and you're kind of projecting on the person or the subject that you're having a crush on. Have you ever had any crushes on anyone? I mean, I guess I'll be completely honest. I haven't had any recent crushes, but... Yeah, there have been people I've had crushes on. Now, did you ever tell them that you had a crush? Most of the time, no. It was only really two instances. Okay. Now, as a kid, there were three instances I could say that I had a crush. And one, it really wasn't even a crush because it was like kindergarten. And it was one of those things where it was almost a peer pressure type thing. Like, oh, you're supposed to you know, like this person or you're supposed to do a certain thing. And, you know, I, I kind of, I, I liked this one girl in, in kindergarten and her and I were remained friends all through school. And we actually started dating in high school, <clears throat> but it, it wasn't anything. I don't think it fit into most of these categories here. I think most of my crushes, wound up happening uh, probably your age or a little bit older, somewhere in that 10th, 11th, 12th grade type range, um, where it's one of those things that there's a certain, I don't know, expectation of what you're supposed to, to have as a relationship type thing. And a lot of it's really kind of imposed on you by society or by your friends. You know, have you ever felt pressured to have, that kind of crush by, you know, the, the your friends at school or anything? I mean, kind of. Obviously not intentionally, but I definitely think um, I was kind of, t- like, looking back at the crushes I have now, I think a lot of it was I wasn't really attracted to this person because looking back, at least two of the people I had crushes on, they weren't really good people, and I didn't really have good reasons for having crushes on them. Again, dealing with more with fantasy as opposed to reality when it comes to crushes. Right. But I think it was a lot of the time, I was kind of expected to have a crush, and I didn't really realize that until I ended up not, stop having, it was like sixth grade, I had like my last crush, and like, I'm like, okay, you know what, I'm not doing this. And then I started realizing that there was a lot of pressure. And I think being around certain friends who, I will be honest, are kind of boy crazy, uh, kind of made me think, am I bad for not really having, like, kind of made me realize, like, there's a lot of pressure on younger people to kind of have crushes because it's kind of expected and it's natural feelings and such. Right. 
Yeah, and I can say that <clears throat> probably the first real crush I had was in sixth grade, and it happened to be uh, we had two different elementary schools that we we had in my town, and I was part of the safety patrol, and this other person that I didn't even know existed went to the other school and we wound up all going to Washington DC on a field trip for the safety patrol. And it wasn't until then that I even knew that these other kids from this other school even existed. <clears throat> now we kind of knew we'd be meeting new kids when we got to the junior high, uh, the next year. And, uh, this was kind of a, a, a chance for us to do a meet and greet. And I, I happened to develop a crush on this trip with her and wanted to get to know her more, but never had a chance to. She lived in a different town than I did. We were bused to the school district. So I knew I wasn't going to have a chance. And my only hope was that I'd have a chance in junior high. So in junior high, we had to take our first year of foreign language. And I didn't know anything about foreign language, but I found out from a friend of mine that this particular girl was going to be in French class. So I said, all right, well, I'll take French class. The, everything that I heard about it was, well, like nobody ever takes French class. There's only ever one class. Everyone takes Spanish or they take German. And there's like three or four classes. So great. This is my chance to get to know her. I'll, I'll be guaranteed to get her in one of my classes. So I'll take French class. No, that year, a lot of people took French class and they split a class into two and she wasn't in my class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it never really worked out. Um, but it, like a ne the next year or so, I wound up getting her, I think, in my English class or something. And I became friends with her and we started to hang out, but just as friends. And I had gone over to her house at one point in time and met her parents and everything and and it just turned out that we weren't interested in each other from anything other than a, a friendship. And it never went anywhere. But it was really funny how how big of a crush I had on her right up until the time I, I got to spend time with her and realized, okay, well, she's not what I thought she was. But she's a, she's a cool person. She's fun to hang out with. And that was about it. Uh, so it was that projection, that ideal of what I wanted to that person to be and then when you're finally exposed to them that's really not who they are yeah so you say we're going to talk about two different types of crushes so we're going to talk about romantic and identity crushes but before we get to that you also mentioned celebrity crush have you ever had a celebrity crush oh uh, to be fair i probably did when i was younger but i didn't realize it uh, but currently no okay See, and I never had a celebrity crush myself. Mommy will joke around that I have a crush on Yvette Nicole Brown, but that's <laughs> only because I think she's, like, really cool and she's a very good person inside from her social media and appearances and stuff. But it's not a crush. Yeah. All right. So, no celebrity crushes. So, let's talk about romantic and identity crushes. Identity crushes are formed when your teen finds someone they much admire – want to become like, or treat as a leader or model they are eager to imitate and follow. Romantic crushes are formed by finding someone whom they find powerfully attractive, who they feel excited to be around, and with whom they want to spend a lot of time. Kind of like how I feel about mommy. Aww. Uh. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. In both cases, the person with the crush gives enormous power of approval to the object of their crush, like wanting to be liked by them or wanting to be like them, willing to do a lot to get in the other person's good graces. They go out of their way to be around each attachment of this crush. Now, when you had these crushes, did you do anything that you wouldn't normally have done if you didn't have a crush? Did you try to be around the person? Did you... Uh, try to be seen by the person. One of the, one of the things that I think was kind of silly when I had my crushes was I always kind of wanted to be, you know, casually seen by the person. So I'd find out from a friend where she'd be, if she was going to be at the mall or the shopping center. And I would just sort of arrange to be there in this 
fictional hope that we'd bump into each other and, you know, I'd get a reaction and we could talk and spend time or something like that. Did you ever do anything like that? I mean, like, I guess some of the crushes I had, like, I had already kind of been friends with them. Well, the one instance I was friends with them, the other instance, I really don't know, but, like, they hung out with us. Um, so, I mean, like, I guess in the one instance, I might have, like, tried to be, like, get them to talk more, or there might have been certain instances. I can't entirely remember too much, but I can definitely see that I would have probably done things that if I didn't have a crush on them, I probably wouldn't have done. Um... But that's really the only case I can really think of, because most of the time I didn't really act upon the crushes, or I didn't really want to be around them because I got nervous around them, I think. I don't know. Yeah, and I, I experienced that, too. Now, when you had these crushes, did you happen to confess it to your friends or to a mutual friend or anything like that, or did you just sort of keep it to yourself? Um, I would sometimes mention it to my friends if it was a serious enough crush. Um, some instances, like, I kind of kept it, like, quiet because it really wasn't, like, a big crush. Other times I have kind of told my friends, and granted some of my friends have, like, done the whole teasing thing about it. Um, um, and I mean, like, mm -mm. I mean, yeah, I kind of would tell my friends... Um, but like, I, I always said it was never really serious too much except right. in the one instance, but you know. Well, I was notoriously passive aggressive with my crushes. I never wanted to directly engage the person until I had some level of confirmation that they'd be receptive. Um, I had this innate fear of rejection like a lot of people do. So I would go about it in different ways. I would have a mutual friend. I would let a mutual friend of ours know and kind of hint that I'd want them to drop hints to the other person and kind of feel them out. Um, in hindsight, it's kind of cowardly to do that. And it never worked out. So it was one of those things where this indirect approach just was not a very effective way of trying to convey it. Uh, eventually it came down to the fact that I had to go and ask this person out on the date. And it takes a lot of courage to muster up the, the will to do that, you know? Yeah. Did the person that you had a crush on ever know that you had a crush on them? Um, well, the one person, no, uh, cause there was a specific example of them clearly conveying they weren't interested in me. Um, to the point I didn't do that it with them. Other times I'd never really even talked to the person, and there were only two instances I technically confessed, and only one of them ended up, and the one ended up leading into rejection, and then the very next day I think, like, I was grouped up with them in, like, a project or table or something, and I realized, oh, wow, they're not really a nice person. Mm. That's the thing. You run into the, the awkward situations when that information sort of gets out there. But I think once it's out there, it makes it a lot easier to get to know the person who they are because we do project on them a lot. Yeah. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we'll talk a little bit more about romantic crushes. We'll be right back. whoop de do whoop de do <laughs> For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today 
at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today we're talking about teen crushes. And now we're going to dive a bit more into romantic crushes. So there was a great outbreak of romantic crushes and gossip around them in middle school. By this time, early, early adolescence and the separation from childhood has caused young people to want to act more grown up, and sexual maturity from puberty has motivated them to act more yo- young manly and young more in more young manly and young womanly ways. Since girls tend to enter puberty before boys, they are more likely to experience the wave of crushes first. More drawn to have crushes than boys are, taking romantic feelings seriously that boys might treat lightly or even laughably. However, the time for same age boys to become romantically smitten is not far off, and when it arrives, a crush proves to be no laughing matter when they become smitten too. Because a romantic crush is a potent mix of idealization and infatuation, it doesn't require knowing another person well at all. <clears throat> In some cases, a superficial impression can be a provocation can be provocation enough. Things like I like how they're so quiet and watchful and keep to themselves, which sounds kind of stalkery you know, <laughs> when you say it like that. I mean, yeah. Uh, or things like I like how what others think doesn't matter to them. As mentioned, although the crush appears to be about attraction to another person, it's actually about projection of valued attributes onto another person, more or less a statement about what they find attractive. Crushes are very revealing. Teens often have crushes on other teens who seem the opposite of them. A serious teen might have a crush on a more fun-loving teen. Crushes are not the only Uh, Not only the stuff that dreams are made of, they signify a lot about the dreamer. So, some risk of romantic crushes. Of course, romantic crushes can have a risky side. You don't want a teenage crush to become a fixation. A young person unable to stop daydreaming and fantasizing about this person, for example. You don't want the young person to act out under the influence of a crush in self endangering ways, soliciting or expressing inappropriate interest. And you don't want the crush to be exploit to be exploited by the and you don't want the crush to be exploited by the object of the crush, such as an older adolescent taking advantage of a romantically besotted besotted younger adolescent, for example. Feelings are always a difficult road for teens to navigate. As teens grow and mature, they experience feelings and emotions they've never felt before. They don't understand these feelings. Sometimes they can't even identify or describe the feelings. This makes it difficult for them to cope with this new and confusing feeling. It also makes it difficult for them to seek out help and advice on how to deal with these things. They often interpret these new feelings through examples they're exposed to. Those examples should be found at home through the guidance of the parents and their guardians. In the absence of that guidance, teens seek out other alternative examples, such as peers, the media, and popular fiction, like uh, books, movies, and television. These alternative sources of examples aren't always the healthiest depiction of how those emotions should be handled. Thus, they can lead to more confusion, frustration, and embarrassment for teens. Because a romantic crush is so intensely felt, parents must not take it lightly or make fun of it. An awakening of romantic f- feelings, it provokes a lot of anxiety because there are many problematic questions for the young person to answer. Like, what am I supposed to do with these feelings? Should they just be kept secret, thus increasing the risk of obsession preoccupation? What if I tell close friends? Suppose it get talked about and teased, thus increasing the risk, of, the risk of embarrassment. What if I have to be around other people who I don't know how I, f- who don't know how I feel? Now being nervous, there is more, there is more risk of doing or saying something awkward. What do I tell this person about my crush? To declare the crush to the person creates the risk of rejection. It is not easy managing a crush. 
So you had talked about having crushes, and at least in one of those instances, you did feel um, a certain experience of rejection. How did that feel? How did you cope with that? Um, to be fair, I somewhat expected it at that point. Um, when I actually confessed, I basically just said, hey, I like you right before I was supposed to leave. I basically like just went up saying that I liked them and then I basically just ran out the door. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so, and like, again, I really hadn't talked to the person before, so I highly doubted that they actually liked me. So I really wasn't going to be all too surprised in that instance. Right. Now, I have to tell you, this this whole thing that you've had crushes kind of comes as a surprise to me. Not a, not a complete surprise. I mean, it's a normal thing. It's just, it's something that we've never talked about as a family. Is there any particular reason we didn't? Did you not feel comfortable talking about it? Is it something you didn't feel you needed to talk about? why am I hearing about this sort of thing? Not that I'm judging. I'm just curious if it was something, was it the way that mommy and daddy were behaving that you didn't think it was, you were comfortable talking to us? Well, I think part of the reason was because I didn't really, none of them really went anywhere. Um, and I didn't really think it was important to mention. And in another case, uh, I guess I was kind of nervous to talk to you about it because uh, the whole thing of, oh, I don't want my little girl to be with um, a guy because I know that guys are dumb and stuff. And, you know. I see. So it was all my fault. I, I mean, you. okay. <laughs> Mommy technically knew more about it. Okay. I kind of told Mommy because I thought she'd I'd relate to her more or she'd relate to me more than you would. So so you were okay talking to mommy at least. Mostly, yeah. Well, I can understand that. I mean, I tend to have a very vocal stance on on how protective I am of you. So I can totally understand you not feeling entirely comfortable. Uh, I hope by now that's subsided a bit and, and we're a little bit, I'm a little bit more level-headed about it. Um but I'm glad you were able to at least talk to mommy about it. <laughs> so there are a few things to know about romantic crushes. One way to manage the feelings is by telling the object of the crush. The language used, how, however, is very important. The ten temptation, because the romanticized feelings are so intense, is to express the feelings with the word love it's probably best that you stay away from such a strong and emotionally charged term such as love. That's not to say that crushes can't lead to love at some point in time. They, they certainly can, but love is a much more complex uh, expression of feeling than what you're probably initially feeling in a crush. Yeah, and I feel like... Now, this doesn't go for everyone, but I feel like most teens... Um, have a harder, don't really understand that love is kind of a really large emotion that they probably aren't, like you said, they probably aren't feeling at that moment. Love is kind of something a little more long term as opposed to just, oh, I really think that person's cool. You know, it wouldn't really mean you love that person, it just means you like them. Right. Kind of. And that, that's a very good point. And, you know, it's best to talk about feelings like this in the terms of liking, kind of like you did when you, you told the person that you like them. It reduces the pressure on everybody. You drop the word love and all of a sudden everyone takes a deep breath and starts to panic and thinks, you know, either you're a stalker or something worse or something like that. So when you say things like, I like talking with you or I like hanging out with you, that expresses the the fondness and the admiration without dropping some big giant hand grenade into the conversation about love. Yeah. You know, keep it simple to the point and see how the other party reacts. It, it's perfectly innocent to tell someone, you know, I really enjoy it when we play this game together. I really enjoy watching movies with you or having conversations with you. It's a way of expressing your appreciation for their time and attention. And it's also a way for, for you to feel out whether or not that feeling is mutual. And if it is, then you can pursue it further from there. 
So by not overwhelming or committing, uh, over committing the, the other person, it gives you an opportunity to determine their feelings and if, the, if it's a mutual feeling between the two of you. It also helps to shelter you from flat-out rejection if you come on too strong and maybe scare the other person off. So stay away from love, stick with like, and see how things go from there. Yep. So most, rog- most romantic crushes don't last very long because once the object of the crush becomes better known, the magic of the other person soon wears off and the ideal falls away. I can't believe I felt he was so great. What was I thinking? However, this kind of crush does have one lasting value. Having experienced an awakening of infatuated feelings, the adolescence has opened themselves up to the pleasure and possibility of romantic love. And I'll be the first one to tell you, you know, romantic love is a wonderful thing. It can, it can lift you up and it can do all kinds of things. It, it can make you more, th- more of a person than you are by yourself when you have the right partner. Uh, but there's risks involved in that. And it's a very tricky and often difficult thing to go down. It requires you to expose yourself to vulnerability. So, when you go that route, ease into it. You know, you don't want to jump right in and, 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 and jump into the deep end if you don't know how to swim yet. Start hanging out with the person. Start liking the person. This, this one person that I had the crush on from, from kindergarten, we got along great in school. We liked the same subjects. We excelled at the same subjects. You know, we would play the same games on the playground and and stuff like that. And when we started dating, she had completely different interests than I did. She didn't like the things I liked. I didn't like the things that she liked. We would, you know, have phone calls and sit on the phone and not say anything because we really had nothing in common. And we kind of tried to make it work because it seemed like it was the thing to do because we had been close friends for so long and it just turned out you know what we're good friends and that's probably as far as we're going to go with it and that's kind of what we wound up going with so when you get to know that person that crush can tend to wear off and i should probably mention this now i've actually had a similar experience um, in one instance where I actually confessed my crush, that ended up leaning into a relationship with the person. Okay. Um, and I... Again, that's news to me. I know. I never told you this. I told mommy. She knows about it, but I never told you. Um, but I will say, um, looking back at it now... It really wasn't anything romantic. There were, like, very small moments, but we had been good friends, and one day we just said that we liked each other. I don't know why I liked him. I guess it was just... I don't know. If you Okay, when you say it like that, you kind of come across kind of hard. Like, I don't know why I liked him. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I can't imagine ever liking no, him. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't know why I liked him romantically. I guess it was the whole thing. I guess another thing, it was kind of like that pressure yeah. um, that society kind of put. And, like, he kind of was one of my, like, first male friends. And I kind of thought that, uh, well, society kind of made me think that maybe there was something that needed to happen. And then I kind of realized that even in the relationship... We really just did friendly gestures. We never really did anything romantic. Even the small things we did romantic seemed like the most friendly things I could imagine. And looking back at it now, I really was never romantically attracted to them. And it was really just a friend thing. Yeah, and that was kind of what I had with this this one particular girl. And it's, every time we would try to take it beyond that sort of friendship type thing, we would run into a roadblock. Like it just, it didn't work. It was like trying to cram a a round peg into a square hole. It just, you know, everything else worked fine as long as we didn't try to 
get to that romantic level. And we finally just said, look, it's, this isn't us. We're just good friends and, and let's keep it at that. And, you know, we've remained friends through high school. Yeah. So anyway, we're going to take our last break here. Uh, and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit more about identity crushes. We'll get off the romantic crushes for a bit here. All right. I could see this is making a some uncomfortable conversation here. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights in the Teens. Today we're talking about teen crushes. And now we're going to delve more into identity crushes. So identity crushes often last longer than romantic crushes because the adolescence is focused not so much on pleasing the other person as on altering themselves, using the leader whom they admire as a model to shape their own growth. So a shy 7th grade kid has a crush on a very popular classmate and wants to become highly social like them, hoping that regular association will rub off as they learn t to become more outgoing. It's an unstated bargain. They get acceptance and inclusion by the popular kid who gets to be looked up in to in this admiring way. Sometimes sexual feelings are aroused in an identity crush, or even acted on to express liking, but that does not usually signify that a romantic fascination has become established, only that the identity crush can have a sexual component. So with that said, have you ever had an identity crush like that on someone else? Maybe someone that was older, uh, kind of a mentor role or something like that? Um, I think there have been instances where, like, I've found a person who had a really good quality and I kind of wanted to be more associated with them um, to maybe, like, learn more about how to get that quality. Um trying to think of a specific example when it that when it came to that because i've had this happen to me actually when i was when i was younger i used to i was one of those kids that hung around radio shack a lot because i love technology love computers and so forth and i happened upon this one manager at the local radio shack who was um a very friendly guy. You know, he was – him and a couple of his employees that were his friends, they were very accepting. Most of most people tried to maintain a, a professional atmosphere. They didn't want kids hanging around or anything like that. And when he saw that I was interested in the technology and the computers, he kind of wanted to take the time to, to teach me how to use it. He was really the person that got me into computers to begin with. And I became very good friends with him. Uh, him and the assistant manager of the store. And the one summer, I spent the entire summer pretty much hanging out at Radio Shack, and I learned so much about it that by the time I was ready to go back to school, people would come in and they would be asking about computers, and I would be playing games on the computer or, or whatever, and they would start asking me, and I'm 16 years old at the time that this happens. And I start answering questions for them, that they didn't expect the 16 year old to have answers to. And I actually wound up getting several sales for the guys just by being there and, and showing them how to use it. And how was six, because most people at the time when they bought computers, 
it was to go do accounting or something like that. Nobody had really home computers at the time for anything other than that and games. And they thought 16 year olds are just going to play games on here. And I showed them all the different applications you could have. And I was basically a live demo in the store there. Um, so I attribute a lot of where I am today in my career to this gentleman named, ironically, Sam, uh, who was the manager at Radio Shack. And I, can look back now. I never knew what an identity crush was, but I can look back now and say, yeah, that was probably an identity crush that I had there because I really admired this guy. He was smart. He was successful at what he was doing. He was compassionate. And he really taught me a lot about computers that set me on my way. So that was kind of the first instance I think I ever had of this type of thing. And, uh, and it was definitely as described in here. Kind of an identity crush. So, but, you know, even with identity crushes, there are risks. You know, of course, the risk with following an admired leader is that the young person with the identity crush may be led astray, which is what some parents fear, myself included. Our kid worships a classmate who rides their skateboard to school, stashes it in their locker, dresses like an outlaw, all in leather and black, and has this angry attitude toward authority. But if we say anything against them, our team gets really angry, defending their romantic hero and criticizing us. What are we supposed to do? Well, nothing. You know, it's it's one of those things that they'll get over it. If that's who they are, then that's who they are. You know, it's a hard situation, but in general, parents need to respect the friendship. They should get to know the friend. And if their behaviors the friend is into, the parents don't want for their kid. They need to talk to them about it not doing those activities. Sometimes they discover that beneath the appearance they find alarming is a person they actually get to like. Or maybe you could even find that, that, that those behaviors are there for a reason and it's a justifiable reason. Or, or maybe, you know, your kid turns out to have a positive influence on that person in reverse and you don't even realize it. So there's a, there's a lot of back and forth that can happen with that. What else do we have? So particularly du during the middle school years, teenage crushes can be the attraction or romantic kind and the admiration identity kind. In both, case in both cases, growth is advanced by this influential experience, most often for the good, but sometimes not. A hard part of crushes is when they are not returned, as, as is often the case. The chosen person may not be aware, interested in, or like being chosen. They don't know I exist. They don't even notice me. These are just some of the feelings of rejection the person experiencing the crush might express. The disappointment is, we is real. This is why parents need to pay attention to the crush relationship and not just discount it and look the other way. And I think we've had this discussion in the past where, you know, rejection is a very difficult thing to deal with, whether it's rejection because you didn't make the team or rejection because you didn't get accepted to a school or because your friends don't want to be around you anymore. It could be any kind of rejection. But I think romantic rejection probably cuts a little bit deeper than most others because of this expectation that you have, this idealized vision that you have. And the probably the, the biggest example I have of that was this one girl that I was, you know, had a crush on, but I was infatuated with, and she was going through a difficult relationship and I was kind of there during that time period and, and kind of consoled her. And, you know, I had this, I was notorious for having this knight in shining armor mentality that, you know, I find, uh, I find a girl who, who has a problem and I rush in to solve that problem. And, and it very rarely works out quite like that. And I became very close to this person and I had developed feelings for her and she was in a very difficult situation at school and she dealt with it by, cause her parents were divorced and her father lived in a different town. She dealt with it by moving away and going to live with her her father and that she never knew how I felt because I never had the courage to tell her. I just kind of was there consoling her as a friend. Um, so she didn't find out until years later how I felt, 
Uh, but her moving away was a, it wasn't an act of rejection on her part because she didn't know about my feelings, but it was probably one of the worst senses of rejection that I think I had in my entire life. And it did just devastated me. And I was, I was miserable for months after that. Um, so, you know, you have to learn how to deal with the rejection, you know? And so we have a couple of hints here, uh, on how to cope, help your teen cope with rejection. This comes to us from Psycom.net. Sounds like a government conspiracy. <laughs> rejection is inevitable. And it comes in many forms during the teen years, but teens dealing with it for the first time can have trouble coping. Here are some things that parents can do to help their teen deal with rejection, whether it be the romantic kind or otherwise. The first thing is to acknowledge it with them. By dismissing or downplaying the rejection, while dismissing or downplaying the rejection might feel uh, right to a parent on a mission to protect the teen from emotional pain, it can actually intensify that pain. Rejection feels isolating and lousy, and teens already know this. What they need is empathy, understanding, and someone who will listen. They don't need to be told that their pain doesn't really matter, when to them it feels like it's the only thing that matters. You should also remain objective. You might be tempted to yell out all of the reasons why your teen's ex is making a huge mistake by breaking up, but responding in anger will only intensify your teen's negative emotional response. Teens look to their parents for cues when they are under stress. It's essential to remain calm and objective in the face of rejection to show your teen that your love is unconditional and this rejection won't actually ruin their life. Remember, your teen will pick up the behavior that you demonstrate. You should also connect with them. This is the time to convey empathy and understanding. Admitting that you don't know exactly how your teen is feeling right this very moment, but that you do know how, what it feels like to face rejection opens the door to conversation. Teens don't necessarily want step-by-step -step instructions on ways to recover from a rejection, but they do want to connect and talk through it. And I think the most important thing is probably examine the overall th thought process. When teens are stuck in a negative thought cycle, they can develop negative core beliefs. This can lead to decreased self-esteem and future risk aversion. In essence, when the teen feels like they can't succeed, they'll avoid trying. Explain to your teen that we all have a negative inner critic that drives our thoughts at times. The inner critic isn't the problem, it's what we choose to do with those critical thoughts that matter. Share a few thoughts that run through your mind when your inner critic is loud. Talk about how you feel as a result of those thoughts. And finally, share ways to reframe those negative thoughts, to refocus on positive thinking. And I think that's really, honestly, that's really what we try to do with a podcast in general is, you know, everybody goes through these things. Everyone has crushes and gets reject it from time to time and a lot of it it's all part of the growth experience it's all part of being a teen you know it 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 kind of stinks that you have to go through these things like i hate to see my kids go through any kind of pain or hurt or anguish but that's kind of what defines who we are in adulthood and how we deal with those things is really what makes us the people that we are later in life and as a parent, it's, it's kind of, it's our job to make sure that you get the guidance that you need to get there. And, you know, rejection from crushes is, is, is no different than that. And, and crushes themselves are no different. It's a learning experience that everybody goes through. And, you know, I don't want to seem cliche, but it's like riding a bike. You know, you get on that bike and you're going to fall a couple of times and you're going to scrape your knee and, you got to get back on that bike and keep trying. And eventually you'll learn to ride that bike. Eventually, after a couple of, you know, experiences, you're going to learn how to navigate those choppy waters of relationships. And you're going to start down that path of where you want to be as a person. Sometimes those relationships aren't romantic. Sometimes those relationships really aren't just friends. But even those friendship relationships could be based on uh, identity crushes. 
Um, but relationships in general are complicated. They take a lot of work if you want them to succeed. Anyway, so we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll get your final thoughts. Ready. All right. All right. So to everyone out there, I just wanted to say that crushes are certainly something that a lot of people experience. And I do also want to point out that if you don't really have crushes, specifically romantic, that it's perfectly justifiable on why you don't, and it's fine if you don't. But there are plenty of people, but if you do experience them, again, it's kind of a natural thing. Um, and it's definitely good to have that experience and learn how to deal with those emotions in order to kind of navigate the waters like you had mentioned before. And again, it's fine also to not really have romantic crushes and to just have identity crushes or to not have any crushes at all. You know, it's all your per own personal journey. That's right. You can always just stick to your orange crush. That works too, right? Or that. <laughs> good drink. Yeah. Good drink. <laughs> anyway, I think that's all we had for today. I think it was a good show. Uh, before we do go, I want to once again uh, reach out to our listening and viewing audience and invite you to subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Teens. You can find video and audio versions of all of our podcasts listed as Insights into Things. You can find us on Apple Podcast, Pandora, Castro, Stitcher, Podbean, Buzzsprout, any place you can get a podcast. I would also uh, invite you to uh, reach out, give us your feedback, tell us what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. Give us your suggestions for show topics. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter at twitter.com slash insights underscore things. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. You can find us on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things, or you can get those links and much more on our official website at insightsintothings.com and you. And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights and Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother Sam. That's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>